Hello wine lovers, Trophy Wine Hunter. Welcome back to my wine channel. Today I'm doing uh, another video in my Bordeaux Basics series. And this is kind of a sum up video of my 1855 classification system videos. Um, and it allows me to reclassify the wines based on today's prices. So before I begin, I'm, you're probably wondering, it's a Bordeaux Basics series. Why do I have an Italian wine in front of me? This is kind of just a, um, uh, promo for one of my previous videos on um, Il Falcone. This is the 2013 vintage from Rivera. I just had the pleasure of drinking or tasting with the owner, Sebastiano de Corrado. And let me tell you, this wine, we just opened this wine uh, together and some of his other wines. And um, it's a great value. So please go to see that video which uh, will be at the end of this video. Um, the owner is a real gentleman, um, real, this is the flagship wine, it's unbelievably priced. In most markets in Canada, it's priced around 30 bucks, but for the quality, it really should be much more. Unfortunately, people have got used to um, that pricing, and so it's very hard for them to kind of push up pricing too much because it is a Puglia wine. Uh, but let me tell you, I think the, um, they're making some more um, innovations um, since 2014. They've hired a new winemaker and they've hired new consultants. They're just trying to get better and better. And so I really am um, a big fan of this winery, especially at the price that they have. And uh, so please go and check them out. The 1855 classification system. So I have spent a number of videos talking about each of the growth wines. So if there's one thing that you can um, take from all my videos is that the 1855 classification system was a judge of um, price per bottle, not of quality. And so I can only equate this to, um, I was trying to think of an example, and I think I equate this to, um, you know, there's a correlation between quality and price per bottle, but it's kind of like happiness and money. You can't, there's a, there, I guess there's a somewhat of a correlation, but you can't say because I have more money, um, I'm, I'm going to be happier. And, and so money was never a, um, meant to be a judge of happiness. And likewise, the 1855 classification system was never meant to be a judge of quality. It was just a, basically an empirical formula where people, um, where a group decided, oh, this is the prices. And these are the categories. And so we kind of put too much emphasis on this. And so if one thing that you can take from this, which would be, um, I think, more knowledgeable than 80% of the wine world, and I think would be impressive people if you told them, hey, you, you understand that 1855 classification system was never a judge of quality, right? And to go through the actual background, I think that would be educational for a lot of people. And based on that, when you reclassify all of these people that kind of reclassify based on oh the quality, they're actually doing it the wrong way. And there's too much um, subjectivity to this. So what I've tried to do is put some objectivity to the reclassification. And so my methodology is I have taken the, um, the last six years of the wine, of each wine, the price of each wine, and then categorize them. For, and you'll see, I'll go through each one of them. Some of them is not com quite complete. Um, and it's very interesting because some of the wines actually have just increased dramatically in the last couple of years. So I'm gonna continue to do reclassify, reclassify each of, of these wines every three years. I don't think it's um, fair to reclassify each year because there is variation from year to year. And I think as we go along and classify more and more, um, it will get better and better in terms of the uh, methodology. Um, and you have to understand, the 1855 classification system was based on price per barrel over a course of time. It wasn't just um, static, it was just one year. And so I'm only taking six years. Um, but even in that six year period, there's been huge variation in some of the prices of some of the wines. So we gotta look at them longer term, and then when we do them longer term, I think that'll be a better judge. A couple of general comments before I begin with my reclassification. 
One that is that in general, I think um, at the higher, at the top end, it's been uh, much more uh, relevant and, con and continued on. And as you get to the bottom, it gets a little bit um, different in terms of, and, and that should be expected because, you know, at the fifth growth level, um, there were a lot more wineries and that were considered and um, there's much more variation. But in general, at the top end, it really hasn't, it hasn't changed as much as at the bottom end. The second thing that we have to um, kind of account for is uh, the addition of more wines in the Pesach Langan region, um, which wasn't really considered at that time. The only one really was Aubryon, but Aubryon was considered more, if you look at my video on the Aubryon wine, because they had a wider distribution ring um, and they were known to other, more people because they had uh, a pub in England. And um, given that, if you're gonna consider other Pesach Langan uh, wines, then uh, that changes um, things up on the classification. The third thing is the emergence of second wines. And so um, I'm not sure in 1855, I don't think there was any of these second wines. So, but the quality of the second wines for a lot of the first growth and second growth, or the, primarily the first growth wines, um, has really um, emerged. And so that they really deserve um, growth status. Um, so these are kind of additions. So in a way, it still um, supports the system because they are still growth wines and they're the second wine of growth wines which are still uh, priced higher than a lot of um, growths. Let's start at the top and that's the first growths. And um, basically there's been no change, which is really um, quite uh, remarkable after 150, 100 and, 100 and some odd years, yeah. Uh, 150 years that still those top wines are still at the top of the game. So and pro basically in the same order, if you look at pricing, Lafitte, Latour, Margot, Aubryon, and Mouton Rothschild are all still um, heads and shoulder clearly above the other wines out there. Um, Latour is a little bit more difficult to judge because now they don't um, come out uh, with their existing vintages like everyone else they kind of go backwards but in general they have kept up their pricing so i would say they they are still in the same order the feet that you remember go up beyond and house which are the first growth wines in my re reclassification let's look at the second growth wines and to me there's eight of them and at the top is for me the mission albion uh, and again this is all based on uh, pricing the only thing that uh, for the Mission and Beyond, they had a huge spike in uh, a couple of years ago in 2016, and it's actually declining. The price is declining a little bit. So we have to watch for that. After that is Palmer, uh, which is clearly, um, this is all based on price per bottle averages over the last um, six years. Then followed by Lieve Lacasse, uh, and then Carouds de Lafitte, which is the um, Lafitte second wine. <clears throat> then comes um, four wines, which are very close in my opinion. So I'm not sure if the order is um, uh, correct. Uh, and the next is uh, Costa Esternel, and then De Cru Bucayou, and then again, two more um, second wines, Le Petit Mouton and Pavilion Rouge Margot. Le Petit, Le Petit Mouton, of course, is the second wine of uh, Mouton Rothschild, the Pavilion Rouge, Rouge is the second wine of Margot. So I will note that, again, uh, the pricing of Coste d'Esternel and De Cru is very close. I think uh, cost is a little bit, uh, the average price is a little bit higher over the six years. And I will note that Le Petit, Le Petit Mouton and Margot in the last two years are higher than both of uh, Coste d'Esternel and De Cru. So we'll watch that. Uh, because there's a trend, but um, it's not a big enough trend at this point where I would put them ahead because over the six year period, in most years, it's been behind. So again, these are all just trends and we have to watch for them, but um, those are clearly, in my view, um, the wines that are kind of uh, clustered together in terms of pricing at the second growth level. Let's go to the third growth level in my books. And again, um, for me, I have nine wines in that category. At the top is um, 
Pichon Baron and Pichon Lalonde. Again, they're very close. And then Monrose. And again, I'll say that all three of these are very, very close in pricing. Um, and again, I just base it on the pricing in BC. Now, it could be a little different other places, but um, I think it gives us um, a good viewpoint in terms of we look at over six years um, and how they're priced. Next in my book is La Clarence Aubryon. Uh, I think that's the second wine of Aubryon. And then um, some fifth growth wines, Ponte Canet and Lynch Bage. And then following that, I have a couple of wines um, from the Passat Laon region. First is Pape Clement and then Ot Bailey, not a growth wine. So it's very funny. You have Ot, uh, the Chateau Batelier and Ot Batelier, which are fifth growths. Ot Bailey was not even a growth wine at uh, 1855, but it's um, emerged out of those as the, um, the wine that I think or based on pricing, deserves a growth status. And then the final one in this um, third growth category for me is Smith Alt Lafitte. And again, these are just um, break points in terms of uh, pricing. Um, you'll see a kind of a distinct group um, and then a little break between each growth. Under my fourth growth wines, I have 14. And this represents um, some second growth, mostly second growth wines that have um, been kind of um, come down based on um, a lot of the emergence of the second wines of the first growth wines and then also the emergence of a lot of uh, Passat Laon wines uh, associated with Old Bion, uh, which weren't considered in the 1855 classification system. So at the top of my list is Calon Segur, which is a third wine, a third growth wine, then Lieville Poit Ferre, a second growth wine, then um, Alter Ego, which is the second wine of Chateau Palmer. And I'll note with that one, I don't really have a lot of um, information because it's not always offered in BC, but just based on um, my limited information, that's where I would place it. It might even be higher, uh, but um, it's very hard to tell because I have limited data. Then the second growth wine, Rosin Sagla, but I will note that that wine is showing um, price elevation in the last couple of years. But if you base it over six years, the last six years, it's um, still in this realm. But again, that looks like it's going up and it could go up um, to another you know, growth status, like a third growth in my books over the coming years. Then Leobo Barton, which is um, up and down, which doesn't have consistency, but it'll be interesting to note what happens to it now that Mr. Barton has passed away. Then uh, Bechevelle, a fourth growth wine. Then Lascombe, which is a second growth wine. Then um, Grand Puy Lacoste. And it, I didn't actually think um, that it was that much of a difference, but the, the Grand Puy uh, Lacoste is much um, elevated in terms of the price compared to the, their neighbor, Grand Puy Ducasse. Um, and I also note that Grand Puy the cost in some years actually is priced higher than Lascombe. But again, we'll watch that over the trend over the next couple of years. Then followed by Le Carme, Aubryon, then Duarte Milon, which is um, existing fourth growth, then Garod La Rose, which is a second growth wine, then um, La Chapelle, uh, Chapelle La Mission Aubryon. I think it's the second wine of uh, La Mission Aubryon. Um, but I'll just note that that has been seen, seen elevated um, prices only in the last few years. Um, if you look back even six years ago, it was um, not even priced at a, you know, in my books, a fifth growth level, but in the last couple of years has really moved up. Um, then Brand Cantonect and Clerc Milan. Clerc Milan, sorry. So, um, but I'll, again, I'll note that all these, and the bottom end, Gerard La Rose, uh, La Chapelle, Chapelle La Mission, Opion, Brand, Cantonac, and Claire Milan are very close in terms of price. And again, hopefully with the next, over the next couple of years, with more statistics and more pricing uh, data, um, we can have a clearer picture of where they're trending. And lastly is my fifth growth. And I have only eight in this category, noting that many of them underneath it could 
um, we're getting down to almost like on average a little bit less than a hundred dollars Canadian a bottle which at that point really isn't a special bottle there's lots of um, other wines that weren't even considered as growth wines that um, would be you know in that price range at today's date so I'm and I'm not as um, flussed if I get the fifth growth wines wrong but again the, there will be other candidates potentially that emerge in the future um, my first at the top of this this is a wine called Dufour Vivant and again I'm just kind of guessing because we never get that in BC I'm just guessing based on pricing I see online that it should probably deserve still a fifth growth status even though it's a second growth in the 1855 classification system then Domaine de Chevalier which is in a passant land then um, Dissant which is a um, third wine then Talbot so Talbot is another wine that I heard of a lot but interestingly we don't actually get it in BC I didn't really realize that that we haven't got this wine in for many years so again I'm just guessing based on um, my statistics on online pricing where it fits then uh, is Gisor, um and and then Malascot uh, Saint Exupéry again these I'm kind of guessing at and really we're talking at the lower end so the pricing is um, not as distinct and so they're all very close um, then all Bataille and then finally Saint Pierre Again, I might have left some off the list, but to me, those are the wines that um, at least have a certain bar, and that's close to about $150 Canadian currently, and over the last six years, um, a little bit more than $100 uh, per bottle. Um, so, yeah, so I'm just looking at my statistics. Uh, for instance, with um, St. Pierre, it averages about $133 a bottle over the last um uh, couple of years um, so in that range and I think that's a kind of a reasonable range f based on a six-year average um, that um, you deserve status so I don't know if you've agreed with um, kind of how how I've cut up the um, wine is in terms of the gross but these are all just um, statistics of course they're not uh, there is some degree of discretion in my books and all the statistics are not um, complete because I, we don't get um, each wine each year but I think in general it shows pretty good trends and interestingly enough I think if I do this every three years we'll have trends that are emerging and um, we'll, we'll see which wines are actually um, going up and, and um, coming down and likewise be able to um, sense what's an emerging wine and what are uh, potentially values you are looking just purely on uh, pricing trends um, a couple of wines stick out one is Le Mission Aubryon which um, it's got a weird trend of it's actually declining in pricing and coming back towards uh, Palmer's pricing so um, perhaps it's kind of peaked and it was overly um, um, appreciated in the last couple of years so we'll have a look look at that um, Le Petit Mouton and Pavilion Rouge look like they have a upwards trajectory so actually they might be priced well at this point because it looks like they're continuing to grow in terms of their um, stat their status and their their pricing um, Rosalind Segla is clearly going up and is clearly being priced um, in or low um, in, over the last six years so you can see that trend is going up so that's a wine that I would watch and try and get before it um, continues to elevate in terms of the pricing and then um, maybe uh, Chappelle Le Mission Aubryon would be another wine that I would watch for that um, shows a upward trend I hope this um, video has been useful and I'm sure many people are now tired of me talking about the 1855 classification system I just think it's a very good way to start to understand Bordeaux and now we'll move on to other regions in Bordeaux I probably will start with um, Sauternes wines and then move to a more difficult topic um, to, under, to explain which is the right bank which is Saint-Emilion and Pomerol um, so you know we'll get through this and then going to um, maybe Passant Longwan Sorry, Grave and then Pesek and then the other minor regions. 
and then I'll be finally done. Um, so with my Bordeaux uh, basic series. Hope you've enjoyed it and hope you continue to um, like, watch and follow. Until next time, happy drinking.